For the final time with a V2 variant Starship test article, this afternoon SpaceX launched an 11th time, and like usual, it was eventful. This flight included the reuse of a Super Heavy booster that was previously used back on flight 8 in March. As for the launch, the test featured a unique engine startup sequence for the booster landing burn in preparation for the next generation of boosters. We also saw the upper stage complete a more aggressive re-entry profile with missing tiles to gather data and prepare for future ship catch attempts. Here I'll go more in depth into the launch, mission milestones, upper stage splashdown, and more. Like a lot of the previous Starship test flights, SpaceX scheduled the launch in the afternoon to make sure the upper stage would complete its landing burn over the Indian Ocean in the daytime. Without any holds for weather or range violations, the clock passed through T-40 seconds. In the final seconds, the water deluge system was activated, followed shortly after by ignition of Super Heavy's 33 Raptor engines. The vehicle then lifted off, marking the second ever flight of a reused Super Heavy booster, which had previously flown on Flight 8. In terms of what's different on the booster, if anything, from the last flight, SpaceX did make a few changes. The company pointed out that 24 of the booster's 33 Raptor engines are flight proven. In other words, they replaced 9 of the engines, with the majority flying for a second time. Views from the ground and the provided telemetry on the official live stream showed that all 33 Raptor engines were firing. It then passed through max Q, the moment of peak mechanical stress on the rocket. By T plus 2 minutes and 37 seconds, Miko occurred, which SpaceX calls most engines cut off. Right after was hot staging, which for a third time featured a deterministic flip. Here, thanks to specific vents being blocked within the hot stage ring, it ensures the upper stage's exhaust pushes the booster in the most efficient direction. This saves propellant, providing more payload capacity. While that was happening, the upper stage ignited its six Raptor engines and began accelerating, with the telemetry showing all engines firing. In the meantime, the booster ignited 12 of its 13 engines, a part of its boost back burn. Not only did the engine graphics show this, but soon after it separated from the ship, you could see that one engine still wasn't firing on that middle ring. While not ideal, the booster has engine out capability, meaning it can still complete its boost back burn and even catch attempts with missing engines. On this launch, similar to Flight 10, the plan was to complete a landing burn and splash down in the water, which is where the booster began heading. In the background, you could see the ship as it began accelerating away from the booster. Views inside the engine bay of the upper stage looked good, with all Raptor engines intact and firing. The booster eventually shut down its middle ring of engines, leaving just the center three. They were then shut down right as the hot stage ring was jettisoned. With this being the last V2 Starship flight, it means that this is the last time we'll see Starship jettison the hot stage ring, as on the V3 variant, it's fixed to the booster and will be reused. Views from the ground showed the booster venting propellant as the hot stage ring flew by. On this flight, a big focus for the booster, besides the fact that it was reused, had to do with its landing burn. The plan was to ignite 13 engines at the start of the landing burn and then transition to a new configuration with 5 engines running for the divert phase, previously done with 3 engines. This is because the planned baseline for the V3 Super Heavy is to use 5 engines during that section of the burn in order to help fine-tune the booster's path and add additional redundancy for spontaneous engine shutdowns. At T plus 6 minutes and 17 seconds, the engine startup began, and interestingly, despite the fact that one of the 13 Raptor engines failed to light during the boost back burn, all 13 lit successfully. Soon after, it transitioned to 5 before finally going to 3 in a hover. They then cut the 3 engines and the booster fell in the ocean, with the feed cutting on impact. They highlighted that the primary goal of this part of the flight test was to measure the real-world vehicle dynamics as engines shut down while transitioning between the different phases. Focusing on the upper stage, all engines were still firing as it approached the end of its burn. At T plus 5 minutes and 8 seconds, Mission Control caught out a nominal trajectory. Just past 9 minutes, the second engine cutoff occurred and they confirmed a good orbit insertion. They moved the flaps and prepared for another Starlink payload demonstration. A view from one of the flaps showed light inside the upper stage as they opened the payload door. They did this for the first time on the last flight, and based on that flight's data, they made a few tweaks, such as to the rails, to try and improve the system. Over the next few minutes, we then watched as they deployed each of the test satellites with the PEZ dispenser. You could barely make out as some of the satellites were deployed from the exterior camera. Eventually, all the payloads were successfully deployed as Starship entered another coast phase. Another 12 minutes passed by before the next mission milestone, leading up to re-entry. At T plus 37 minutes and 49 seconds, they ignited one of the ship's sea level Raptor engines in a Raptor in space relight demo. The test only lasted a few seconds, with the other sea level engines gimbling out of the way during the fire. We saw this on Flight 10, and again it was successful. In the future, when Starship is actually launched into orbit, it'll need the ability to light Raptor engines in space to slow it down and re enter the atmosphere. About 10 minutes after the test, we began to see the start of a reentry with plasma building up around the vehicle. While many past Starship flights have included missing or altered tiles, this test in particular had large patches of missing tiles. In addition, SpaceX pointed out beforehand that several of the missing tiles were in areas where tiles are bonded to the vehicle and did not have a backup ablative layer. 
In other words, part of the ship where they were expecting extreme heating, they left parts of the ship as just bare steel. Around 46 minutes in, they showed one of the flaps with various heat shield tiles visible. In this case, they added the tiles to test the strength of their attachment to Starship, and whether or not they would stay on. They pointed out that it looks like a few of them were missing, but most were still in place. At T plus 52 minutes, they showed some great views inside the engine bay with reentry heating visible. The skirt was also intact, unlike the last flight, which suffered some damage. If all the missing tiles weren't enough, SpaceX also wanted to try a banking maneuver during reentry. You can see an example of this at T plus 58 minutes with the ship sliding off to the side. They were heading to the same exact landing point in the water as the last flight, but were taking a slightly different path with all the banking. Overall, the reentry phase looked to go quite smoothly, with no obvious views of flaps, for example, being eaten up by the heat like on past flights. At T plus 1 hour, 3 minutes and 40 seconds, Starship was transonic and beginning its belly flop. This position helped slow the ship and prepared for a landing burn. At this point, it was also clear that heating-wise, the side of the ship looked to be in very good condition, with minimal heating damage. As for the flaps, while we didn't get the best camera angles of them from this initial footage, they also looked to be in good condition without any substantial chunks missing. With less than 20 seconds before the landing burn, the vehicle had slowed down to around 350 kilometers an hour and was under 2 kilometers high. Right as it entered the clouds, it ignited the three center Raptor engines, swinging the bottom of the stage and aligning itself vertically. It then cut off one of its engines as planned and then slowly lowered itself into the water. A buoy camera right next to it showed splashdown and then a large explosion as it tipped over and impacted the water. Looking at the flip again, you can actually see the buoy floating in the water as Starship lands. Similar to previous flights, based on its proximity to the camera, it definitely was an accurate landing. Also, earlier in the official livestream, SpaceX cut to a live feed of a drone positioned at the splashdown location. We can assume that in the near future, they'll release a much higher quality video and angles from both the buoy and drone. Once available, that'll give us a much better idea of how the ship held up, specifically in areas like the flaps and missing tile locations. While Starship V2 had a rough few first flights that ended earlier than hoped, its last flight was able to complete all of its mission milestones and splash down in the Indian Ocean. The next time we see Starship fly, it'll be with a highly upgraded V3 variant and will launch from a different pad. Over the next few months, SpaceX will continue preparing both a new booster and ship for the first V3 flight. Already, parts of the stages have been spotted as production continues. We will have to wait and see how it progresses and the impact it has on the space industry. Thank you very much for watching.